Hello YouTube, welcome to Proctology for Beginners, Episode 1. Seriously, this is my uh, shopping routine. Um, gloves, not as an alternative to hand washing, as well as I'm the world's worst face toucher, and they remind me, put them on before I go into the shop, take them off immediately when I come out, I won't be touching my face. So, not a substitute for washing, but just helps me. Right, all done, just clean up, got some alcohol wipes, gloves are off, get in, get out, get what you need, don't come within two meters of other people. Uh, rant over I think. Right, here we are back at work. Essential workforce only, special measures to prevent spread of coronavirus, thanks to all the drivers who just leave the parcels, we don't have to sign for anything now, they photograph them and they go. It is eerily quiet. I've just swept the floors while it's full of rubbish. Two of us come in, we maintain a strict two meter distance. More than that, generally 10 probably. It's a big hanger. Don't share the tea room or the office anymore. Uh, we wash, we go in, we come out, we wash again. And if you're uh, stuck at home watching this, which a lot of you probably are, You'll have used up the rest of YouTube, obviously, before you get to my video, but, and the rest of the internet, and everything streamed by Disney and everyone else. But you could find yourself here, in this dark place. Stay safe. Frequent hand washing. All the things the government is telling you to do, just do them. Don't come within two meters of other people. If you don't have to, if they're not in your household, you can stay safe from this thing. The other thing that occurred to me is pretty clear now that you can spread it when you're asymptomatic. You may have it, you may feel perfectly well, I feel fine. It's a possibility that I have coronavirus. There's a responsibility on all of us not to spread it. Not just, uh, I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm a young guy, I'm healthy, I'm not gonna go down with coronavirus, but you might make someone else seriously ill or dead. Anyway, enough of this. Let's distract ourselves from uh, what's bad in the world because we will get through this one way or another. And as I say, I'm aware that I'm hugely privileged to be able to come to work at all um, and that I'm not under any pressure to go and work in a call centre or something horrible like that where I would be forced into close proximity with other people. I don't think that's on. I think you should be paid and allowed to go home. Rant over. Right, let's distract ourselves with a little look inside an aircraft engine. There's the prop, there's the propeller flange, crankshaft, and this is the uh, number four crank pin and connecting rod. There is the, there is the connecting rod. Let's pop that just back under there. I'll show you what we're looking at because there's an old crankshaft which is out here and if you imagine that my hand there is the connecting rod if something pushes on that it'll rotate the crankshaft and turn a prop which is what we want and we've got four more cylinders on four more crank pins that was a journal that's a crank pin doing the same job but out of phase and that will keep an engine running. We go. I don't know if I can do this, but if I take, get a little bit of pressure on here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm turning the prop. So, what we need to know now, it's like a pedal on a bicycle. What we need to know now is what produces the pressure. And that is, let's put that back under there. Cylinder, valves, piston. What actually produces the pressure is expanding gas pushing on the crown of the piston after we have burned fuel and air inside the top of the cylinder. It's that simple. All we've got to do is make sure that the fuel and air gets in, gets burned at the right time, it gets out again and some more gets in for the next uh, two revolutions because it's a four-stroke engine it 
it fires every other revolution and purges the exhaust gas and takes in new air on the intermediate revolutions if you like you can you can look all that up on the internet suck squeeze bang and blow sounds better than it is but uh, the principle of a four stroke engine is there we'll concentrate on the bang for now right and the uh, bits and pieces there all right so piston attaches here using this wrist pin which just pushes through and has soft plugs on the end which just uh, rub lightly on the cylinder walls to keep it in um, that's it this piston looks fairly new it's got new rings on it it's been uh, honed and overhauled it's ready to go or the cylinder's been honed the pistons had new rings and these dark patches you can see are the little patches of lead I think as a pre-lubricant um, rather than having aluminium rubbing on steel so like Hamming used to do that for a little while it looks like TCM have started doing it I think the grey areas are, are little lead plating patches very thin layer it soon disappears but it does its job initially right can we do suck squeeze bang and blow quickly here yeah top of this cylinder okay this is the cylinder steel there's the barrel piston that goes inside it head exhaust port inlet port and two mushroom headed valves which you can see see the ends of them inside there and when when a push rod pushes up here pushes a rocker down on here opens this valve which opens this inlet port, this inlet port to the cylinder. Right, so let's see if we can remember this. Piston, imagine it's inside the cylinder. Let's start with it at the top. Inlet valve opens, piston goes down. That will draw in fuel and air from the carburetor and the induction manifold. Okay. Now this is a four cylinder engine, so one of the other cylinders will be on power stroke at this time. Piston is forced up with both valves closed, compressing the fuel and air. Crankshaft continues to rotate as it, at some point, we need a spark, and there's a spark plug to light the fuel and air mixture. Once it's burning, as the piston passes top dead centre, creates a lot of expanding gas and really drives that piston down with a lot of pressure, you can work it out. There's quite a big area there, several square inches. A lot of force on a piston when it's going down. What happens next? That's the power stroke for this cylinder, okay? We've got a flywheel effect from the propeller or flywheel that continues the engine in motion. So the piston passes bottom dead center and begins to come up again. Just before it gets to bottom dead center, this exhaust valve will have opened to let the pressure out of the expanding gas. So it comes up, it drives up until the cylinder is empty and the inlet valve then needs to open again to start letting new charge in. So the inlet valve opens just before the exhaust valve closes, which is called overlap, which allows some gases to continue to be drawn out and a little charge to be drawn in. Okay, and then down again on the induction stroke with the inlet valve open, exhaust valve closed, more air, more fuel. Up again on a compression stroke with both valves closed. Ignition down on the power stroke, both valves closed. Just before bottom dead centre on the power stroke, exhaust valves opens, lets the pressure off. Exhaust stroke, up we come again for another suck, squeeze, bang, blow. <laughs> How's that? Now you can probably see we're looking down into the cylinder now and that's the piston with its piston rings on it. One of the challenges here is to get a gas tight seal around that piston in a very harsh environment. You've got flame on top and oil underneath. And we want to keep as much as possible of the gas and flame on top and as much as possible of the oil underneath in the crankcase. But we need the oil in the bore to lubricate the piston rings and uh, over the years that's evolved into a kind of a sophisticated set of rings. We have a scraper ring at the bottom there, an oil control ring and compression rings at the top. 
Now, let's just not get too technical here. You have to kind of accept that that's the way it is. That's the way the design of these things has evolved. But let's just have a look at a couple of key things. All right, so I've just taken the top ring out of its groove in the piston here. We'll just offer it into the bore. Here we go. Square it up. I'm going to use the piston to do this, but it's got the other rings. You can see that that is a tight spring fit in the bore under its own tension. Little gap there, which is uh, important. That has to be within certain limits. But it fits tight. It's a hard chrome ring for a steel bore inside this bore, which is probably nitrided steel. But when you look at the finish on the bore, apart from these scratches where people have been putting rings in it, see this crossed hatched honing pattern. And that is key to the whole deal of this ring being able to go up and down in this cylinder millions of times provide a gas tight seal and not slice its way right through the cylinder wall which is very thin um, that's uh, enough of that it's time to go home and have a look at a piece of paper okay welcome to my humble abode yeah and uh, thank you one to Culinary Stew for your subscription. Everybody's welcome to come into this virtual uh, home since you've got nowhere else to particularly be at the moment, most of you, unfortunately. But such is life. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one to Culinary Stew. Thank you for your subscription. I got your G&T ready because I know you don't like coffee. So uh, we were talking about the importance of this pattern inside the cylinder to cross hatching all right rubbish sketch connecting rod piston with its rings and inside the, all of the cylinder wall the inside of it is covered with this cross hatch pattern okay so here's my here's my uh, tonic piston is going up and down like this it's got its rings in its grooves and the rings are rubbing the sides of the bore forming a seal because they sprung, sprung, spring and sprung and sprung into it, all rubbing against this nice cross hatch pattern created with a honing tool. Why is it important? This is a zoom in using the magic of uh, stuff to this little bit here. So the piston ring and the cylinder wall, da da da. Right. Just the piston ring, enormous in section. This is the cylinder wall, and those honing marks are actually scratches in the wall, varying in depth. Some are quite shallow, some are quite deep. All in a flat, hard, nitrided steel cylinder wall. And this is a hard chrome ring. And in any other circumstances, if they rubbed against each other, they would do each other damage. But in the first few hours of operation, we run these engines on straight mineral oil. It doesn't have uh, detergents and scavenging agents to keep the engine clean. So uh, sort of a varnish of hot oil and combustion products builds up in these scratches. Builds up, fills the shallow ones quite quickly. And uh, a correctly bedded cylinder wall looks kind of like golden syrup with some of the deep scratches still showing. It's hard to describe. We'll try and get a picture of it one day with the boroscope. But that surface which forms, which has a combination as the ring slides over it of nitrided steel, uh, shallow grooves filled up with varnish and combustion products, and deep grooves that can retain a little oil don't always fill completely, and other filled up grooves. That surface creates or if you like holds a film of oil on it and that piston and rings can go up and down there a lot of times we'll do the math in a second and uh, it's ah, it's interesting to me might be dead boring to most of you but like i said you ain't got much else to do all right i'm not very good at maths the engine does 2,000, say in the cruise, 2,300 revs per minute. 
multiplied by 60, that's going to be the revolutions per hour. Multiply by the manufacturer's recommended life of the engine, 2,000 hours. Going to be a big number. I think that's 276 million. This surface that forms in the first few hours of operation of steel, little scratch with varnish in it, uh, another little scratch. Some of the deep, some of the light scratches will wear out during service life. Some of the deeper ones will remain. This surface that forms on the side of this bore is so resistant that piston with its rings on and with its hot flames behind it can go up and down that bore 276 million times and it don't wear out. And we see on the stronger engines that have been correctly operated, they'll do more than that. Um, they'll go to 2400 hours, 2600 hours sometimes, you look after them properly. Without cylinder overhaul, some of the better ones, which to me is quite remarkable. Hope you've enjoyed that. I'll shut up now. Stay safe, good night. Oh, don't forget, like, share and subscribe. You ain't got anything else to do now. Cheers. One more thing. There's a lot of people who can't watch these videos because they ain't got time to sit at home. Key workers, carers, people in the NHS. These guys have been taken advantage of for years, let's face it. I'm not talking about consultants and surgeons and everything else, and GPs. I'm talking about the people who do the stuff that keeps the country working in the background. They all gotta go into work. They all gotta risk their lives in case we are unfortunate or stupid or both. So remember them and perhaps uh, things might change for the better when we're through the other side of this. Good night.